Thank you, uh, Chairperson Lockwood and Man Ranking Member Davis and members of the committee for this invitation to join you today on this hearing. In, uh, in April, I, invited, I was invited to testify before the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, hearing entitled Jim Crow 2021, the latest assault on the right to vote. The testimony I'll share with you this afternoon is similar to what I shared with that committee in April. My main point is the same. Whether you classify state's new election laws as Jim Crow 2021 or election subversion, your argument is flawed and offensive. As I'll explain, I experienced the actual Jim Crow as I was as a youth. The right to vote for many members of my, of my community and family were actually subverted. State requirements today that require voters ID that actually expand voters access is not even close to the evil subversive practice of 1960 Jim Crow experience. My American story begins with my great great grandfather, Silas Burgess, who arrived in America as a child shackled in the belly of a slave ship. Siles was sold in an auction block with his mother in Charleston, South Carolina, to the Burgess Plantation. He escaped through the Underground Railroad and later became a successful entrepreneur, first purchasing 102 acres of farmland paid off in two years. My grandfather, Oscar Kirby, served our country in World War I and was a respected and successful farmer, raising 12 children, all of whom graduated from college. My father, Clarence Burgess, only senior, was stationed in the Philippines at the end of World War II. When he returned to Texas, actual Jim Crow laws denied him postgraduate education, raising it in a generation that used these tactics as motivation. He received his PhD in agronomy at Ohio State University and had a successful career as professor, researcher, and entrepreneur. I grew up in the Deep South in Tallahassee, Florida in the 1960s during the days of KKK, Jim Crow, and segregation in the area of actual institutional racism. My first experience with white Americans wasn't until, until I, was eight, I was 16 years old. At 18 years old, I was the third black athlete to receive a scholarship to play football at the University of Miami. Now, I proudly represent Utah's fourth congressional district in the United States uh, Congress. I sit before you today as someone who has lived the American dream, as a means of, of Americans of all races from every background. This is due to our country's mission statement that all men and women are created equal. A mission statement that every American should have the opportunity for life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. As someone who actually experienced Jim Crow laws, I'd like to set the, straight, the record straight and the myths regarding the recently passed Georgia state law and those other laws across our country now called election subversion, which is, which is absolutely outrageous. Here's a few examples of my life of what Jim Crow laws actually look like, subversion, what it really looks like. At the age of 12, my father allowed me to participate in a demonstration with Florida a and college students in front of the segregated Florida State Theater, which because of our color, we could not enter. I was the youngest participant there, and only 50 years later did I learn from my father that he had parked across the street to watch and make sure I was safe. In the seventh grade, my school never received new books. Instead, we received used old books from the all-white school across town. At service stations, there were white men-only restrooms white women-only restrooms, and one filthy restroom in the back of the station for Black Americans designated as colored. In addition, subversive laws like poll tax, property tests, literacy tests, violence and intimidation at the polls made it nearly impossible for Black Americans to vote. The section of the state of the state uh, law seeking voter integrity that has brought so much outrage from the left simply requires any person, regardless of race, creed, or color, applying for an absentee ballot to include e evidence of a, go a government-issued ID on their application. If a voter does not have the driver's license or ID card, that voter can use a current utility bill, bank statement, government check, paycheck, or other government document that shows the name and address of this voter. If a voter somehow can't produce one of the above forms of ID, that voter may still cast a provisional ballot. By the way, 97% of Georgia voters where subversion was a, where Jim Crow uh, uh, tactics were charged includes Black Americans already have government issued ID. What I found offensive is the narrative from the left that Black people are not smart enough, not educated enough, not desirous enough for independence to do what every other culture and race does in this country: get an ID. True racism is this: the soft bigotry of low expectations. President Biden said of the Georgia law, this is Jim Crow on steroids. With all due respect, Mr. President, you know better. It is disgusting and offensive to compare the actual voter suppression and violence of the era that, that we grew up in 
with any state law that only asks people to show their ID. This type of fear marking uh, fear marking I expected in the 1960s is not today. It's time for this subversive view of soft bigotry of low expectation regarding Black Americans to end. We, like the rest of Americans, expect one thing called voter integrity. Our vote should count. It should be easy to vote, hard to cheat, and we ask no more, no less than every other American. I thank you and appreciate the opportunity to, to share this. Gentlemen's time thoughts. has expired. Thank you for your testimony. And finally, Congresswoman Williams, you are recognized for about five minutes. Uh, Mr. Cuccinelli, you are now recognized for about five minutes. And you are remote, I believe. Yes, ma'am. So Chairman Lofgren, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me today to discuss the quality and integrity of our voting systems and the safety of the people who run them. Uh, thankfully, it is already illegal in every state to harass or threaten election officials or any citizen. Uh, I would note that uh, this was a problem that we wish we had Congress's support for back when I was in the Department of Homeland Security instead of encouraging people who were performing the kind of unrest that you heard just described in Detroit. Uh, as you know, I previously served as Deputy Secretary of Homeland Security. I've been the Attorney General of Virginia, and I currently serve as the chairman of the Election Transparency Initiative, where we work every day to help improve the transparency, security, accessibility, safety, and accountability of elections in every state so every American, regardless of their party affiliation or the color of their skin, can have confidence in the outcome of every election. Today, it's easier to register and vote than it ever has been before in our history, regardless of where you live, what color you are, or what party you vote for. We should be celebrating this as a great accomplishment while always looking to improve. Instead, many in Congress would like to impose a federal takeover in various pieces. The particular bill you've talked about today is one smaller piece, uh, but we've heard uh, the previous speakers talk about the federal preclearance bill, the John Lewis bill incoming, H.R. 1, as Mr. Sarbanes mentioned, and su suggests that access to voting today is actually worse than it was in 1965, which is patently outrageous. But the lying demagoguery coming from much of the radical left, including the title of this hearing, is not constructive and represents a large-scale attempt to knowingly convince the American people of a false narrative, namely, that since the Shelby County ruling by the Supreme Court in 2013, America has been suffering from a rash of voter suppression including violence. Thankfully, the data demonstrates this narrative is blatantly false. And rather than make general allegations, let me be specific about some of the radical leftists who are lying to the American people. It starts at the top with President Biden. Even the leftist Washington Post had to give President Biden their strongest lying rating of four Pinocchios for his blatantly false statements about Georgia's recent election reform efforts. And he is the highest voice shouting the now familiar trope of Jim Crow 2.0, which we heard Congressman Owens speak to so eloquently and from his own personal experience. Not to be left out, Vice President Harris recently flip-flopped from her anti-voter ID position in an interview on BET, an interview in which that flip-flop was overshadowed by her comment that people who live in rural communities aren't capable, i.e. smart enough, to use voter IDs to conduct their voting. Vice President Harris's rural people are stupid view is no less prejudiced than her view shared implicitly by so many others on the left, that minorities are somehow incapable of getting and using voter IDs like everyone else. And I hear very little discussion of how critical these IDs are to just participate in our society and its economic opportunities. A sad commentary. In addition to the data simply not supporting this prejudiced view, it's one of the most offensive aspects of the entire contemporary public discussion. One of the most senior members of this body, Congressman Clyburn, recently not only flip-flopped on his previous position that requiring voter IDs is racist, but even denied ever holding such a position. And beyond just that, he further denied that anyone in Congress ever held such a position. Given that members of this very committee have suggested that requiring voter ID is suppressionist, at least, or racist at worst, you all know Congressman Clyburn's denial was without foundation. And like President Biden, Congressman Cly Clyburn 
also earned the Washington Post's four Pinocchios rating for his lies on the subject. Of course, no list of lying left-wing race baiters would be complete without Stacey Abrams, who, like Congressman Clyburn, both flip-flopped on her voter ID's racist position and denied ever holding such a position. And most recently, Pennsylvania Governor Tom Wolf staged a spectacular flip-flop of his own, suddenly declaring he is now open to changing the state's voter ID laws less than three weeks after vetoing a common-sense vote of piece of updating legislation that included voter ID provisions called the Voting Rights Protection Act brought forward by their General Assembly. What do these flip-flopping race baiters have in common? Two things, timing and polling. What do I mean? First, because of the political necessity of getting federal legislation through a 50-50 Senate, following West Virginia Senator Manchin's indication he'd require some sort of voter ID to support national legislation, President Biden, Vice President Harris, Congressman Clyburn, Stacey Abrams, and many others on the left had to cast aside their false voter ID as racist. The, the, the gentleman's time has expired. I'll give some, a little more time to wrap up. but I will wrap up. We've been easy Thank on the gavel with everyone. but Yes, ma'am, I'll wrap up. Second, the polling has, shif has not shifted despite six months of attacks. Uh, American people still support access and integrity measures, which continue even in this hearing to be called voter suppression. And I'll wrap my time up. I look forward to discussing these subjects further. Thank the chairwoman for the additional time. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, this is now the time in our hearing when members of the uh, committee may pose questions.